This is Karen Brewster, and today is March 20th, 2014. I'm here with Dave Klein and Pat Valkenberg uh, at Dave's house in Fairbanks, Alaska, and this is for the Wildlife Society's Conserving Our Conservation History or Heritage Project. Thank you, Dave. Just to get us started, so for people who don't know you, uh, we'll do a little background. So tell me when and where you were born. I was born in Pittsburgh, Massachusetts in 1927. And uh, family moved to Heartland, Vermont, uh, partly related to the Depression. And my father uh, was working for Johnson Arson Cycle in Pittsburgh and he was laid off and so we moved to Heartland, Vermont, close to my grandfather's, my mother's father's farm, a small subsistence dairy farm where it was good to be close to that farm during the aggression when we could get things from there but we also lived at a small and in Heartland uh, and an old farmstead where we were able to have animals, chickens and occasional calves raised for veal and geese and harvest our own maple syrup, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, I went to the four room schoolhouse there in Heartland for the first two elementary years. And then we moved to Connecticut I think it was in the late 1930s when my father got a job there. He was a machinist and he got a job at a company that was making helicopter parts for Sikorsky helicopters, which were becoming useful and functional. And it was pre-war years when it was realized that helicopters would probably have a role to play in, in war. And then you have siblings? Yep, uh, older brother, brother, two years older, and an older sister, six years older. And, um, right. So what was your childhood like? It was very, for me, it was like Nirvana. It was rural, New England, uh, hilly, pine forests, and, uh, small farms and small village and uh, the, I didn't know what city life was like but I knew what it was like from my parents and they knew that they preferred rural living and uh, my brother and I particularly uh, we had a hard time when we moved to Connecticut because my dad work, was working in Hartford in the factory and so we got we moved into a the only place available for rental was a, one of these apartment complexes with six apartments in one building and uh, intense human <laughs> presence and uh, we had to learn to live with cultural diversity too because there were you know French Canadians living close by who went to the uh, Catholic schools and we went to the public schools and we had to walk several blocks uh, before the days of school buses and uh, and when we were in our schools we were kidded my brother and I because we talked funny <laughs> we talked like hicks which we were <laughs> and what were your parents names uh, my dad uh, was Ferdinand no middle initial, her name, Ferdinand Klein. And his parents had emigrated from Switzerland uh, about, his father was of German heritage and his mother was of French heritage, but they were living in Switzerland. They moved to New York City and that's where my father was born. My mother <coughs> was born in, uh, I think, Syracuse, New York, 
and uh, and her parents were from both parents were from uh, I think they were born in Canada and the US but they were uh, uh, English heritage and her first name was uh, Norma and her maiden name Peverly P-E-V-E-R L E Y. And so we're going to jump ahead a little bit to you going to college and uh, what happened there and getting your educational training. Well, I, well, first of all, we in the city, we, uh, Hartford, we didn't stay, we stayed there for about four years and found a better living situation with a, a house we rented in with a big yard and an orchard and the landlord had bees which was interesting and uh, and so it was not a bad place for my brother and I and then we moved parents finally uh, were financially able to buy a old house and some land in uh, Buckland, Connecticut, which was near Manchester. And so I finished up my elementary school there in a four-room schoolhouse again, and uh, then uh, went to Manchester High, uh, which was, uh, Manchester's was where the Cheney silk mills existed, and it was quite a nice town and uh, diversity of people, mostly all Europeans, but uh, uh, different different European countries. And uh, so the uh, I went to school there and got out of uh, high school, graduated from high school in 1945. We were still at war in the Pacific the Japanese and though young men at that age 18 were 1A for the, the draft and enlisted in the Navy to in a flight training program to avoid being drafted probably but um, the whole family my brother was in the Air Force and my sister was in the wax and during the war, and so the war in Europe was was very important to family, but, and you know, there wasn't any question about serving the war at that time. So then, when I got out of the, when the war was over. So you went into the Navy flight training? Yeah. Okay. And then, but then in the war, uh, was over six months after I was in. So we had the choice of staying in, continuing on with the flight training and getting your commission and becoming a pilot then. But you had to stay in for six more years after you finally got your commission, which I didn't, wasn't interested in the military yet after the war was over. And so I got out and when my time was up and uh, came back to Connecticut and and uh, I didn't really know, I had a little GI Bill from spending time in the Navy and uh, and my, all my school buddies were pretty much in the, in the university and taking advantage of, they had, most of them had been in service a short time like me and uh, so, but I wasn't ready to do that. I didn't know what I really wanted to be. I used to think that farming was like the, the farming life and the working with animals and growing things. And But then I uh, realized that I was also had broader interest in just living on the farm and I was becoming interested in the things around the farm, my grandfather's farm, like the trout stream and 
and the wildlife that would come, the deer that would come to eat his apples, and and I realized that I was more interested in general ecology, and but also I was interested in the landscape and the and the fora and the, the forests, the hardwood forests, and the transition from hardwood to conifers of New England, and uh, so our forestry was another interest, and so. I uh, got a job with the State Forestry Department in Connecticut working, doing woods work in one of the state forests mainly, and I was able to live in a cabin that they had that I put a wood stove in, and I liked that kind of adventurous life on my own, uh, and it was about 40 miles away from my home where my brother, my, my, the rest of my family was living. And then uh, in that, working with uh, field crews in the forest was enjoyable. We did a lot of, it worked all winter long and then pine plantation, did some logging in hardwood forests. And uh, so I learned some good skills including how to use an ax properly and sharpen it and uh, sweet saws we used. But we also, when we were logging in hardwood forests, we had a small cat and a giant two-person so uh, uh, chainsaw, mm -hmm. which was a disaster if you were mm -hmm. on the power end of it because uh, was, you, the exhaust came up in your face and you had this vibrating mass that you had to hold and it would you could only handle it for about a half an hour and you had to trade off with somebody else <laughs> so then uh, that was I liked that kind of woods work and, and but the, all of these other guys that were about my age veterans mostly and that working there and two of us got the idea of coming to uh, coming to Alaska because Alaska Highway, we heard, was uh, completed and uh, had just been completed and we wanted to see the country a little more. In the Navy, I only got to the East Coast uh, uh, in Chicago and didn't get to see much of the West and I was already focused on liking mountain areas in, in New England I liked New Hampshire and Vermont because they were more mountainous <laughs> and Massachusetts and Connecticut. Uh, so we, two of us, I rebuilt a old Model A Ford Roadster that was in pretty good condition after it was rebuilt, the engine was rebuilt and we, um, two of us drove to Alaska in 1947. and. Uh, with the intent to work in Alaska in the summertime and then go back. And, uh, but I didn't have any specific goals other than to come and see more of the country. And so then uh, in Alaska, I said, uh, Ed Wass was a fellow that came with me. He was a uh, Polish heritage in, I lived in Middletown, Connecticut, and he got a, he'd in, been in the army and during the war and had worked in a uh, railroad switchyard. And so he got a job right away in Fairbanks working at uh, the, uh, out at Ladd Field, which was former Fort Wainwright, and uh, switching engines and what. So he had a good job for the summer, and he worked for the su whole summer, then he flew back home. I uh, wasn't so fortunate. <laughs> I wanted to work, find a, uh, a uh, some job that would get me out and see the field and out in the country, and I had hoped to, I'd heard about the geological survey doing, having field groups up, groups up in, uh, in uh, National Petroleum Reserve. Yeah. 
And uh, but by the time we got arrived in Fairbanks, it was in about mid June, and uh, they'd already headed out to the field. And so that was not an option. And I figured, well, firefighting would be a good option, but it was a wet spring. <laughs> so I finally, aching, uh, trying to extend my limited cash I had living in the poorest uh, bunkhouse available, the only bunkhouse available that was, didn't cost very much a night, uh, and struggling along, and met a guy who was a builder, but he had overwintered in the Brooks Range, Tony Butler. And uh, he had wintered in the Brooks Range with uh, an old timer, Frank Young, who was married to a native woman and uh, from Bettles. But they had overwintered and they trapped. He was a prospector and they, he trapped they trapped and they lived at Wild Lake. And so Tony had overwintered with them. And he was fascinated with the trapping and, and then he saw the potential, uh, which he thought was a good potential at the time, of maybe building a hunting and fishing lodge on the lake. And so he offered that, that opportunity if we worked with him in construction in Fairbanks and Mainly we were putting siding on houses and some roofing and some interior work and the subcontracting from other people. And uh, then at the end of summer, we would go up to Wild Lake and build the first cabin on the lake for this hunting lodge. Well, that all sounded great to me from my limited experience in New England of, of real wild country and wilderness and this was it. I was here in Alaska and realized that, damn, this is gonna be, I was, I was really lucky. So we got up there, it took a little while because- So that was working, Tony Butler is who you worked for. Yeah. yeah. So um, there was another young guy from Oklahoma who joined up, that he and I joined up in, Tony, we were handy with the hammers and the tools, but he taught us how to put on the siding and and had the tools necessary. And I had the only transportation available in my Model <laughs> A Ford. And so we drove around town and did the siding work on houses then. And then we planned to, to fly up to Wild Lake at the end of summer. We had a little problem because Tony had a habit of, of spending the money in the evenings when he'd go out and- On liquid refreshments? On liquid refreshments, but he had, he liked women a lot too. <laughs> and, uh, so we finally went on strike and refused to continue working unless he made a real commitment to save enough money to, so we could go up and the brook and to Wild Lake and the Brooks Range. And we did that. And finally, and uh, planned about a little over a month up on Wild Lake, built a rustic cabin and uh, did some terrific lake trout fishing and lake dressing. Did a little hunting and uh, mountain sheep and moose and and uh, fell in, I fell in love, of course, with Alaska and especially the Brooks Range. But after, <coughs> We came back, we had more, we started to pay off some of the charter aircraft costs. And we flew up out of Weeks Field right away and landed at Bettles and with a Norseman and then we transferred to a small cub to fly a shuttle, our stuff up to Wild Lake and the same coming back. Well, no, we came back all the way in cups, I guess. But um, that was an interesting experience of flying in those days. And, uh, and it was, I mean, it was, I was living on a high because it was, I, it was better than I imagined in, in Alaska. And that, of course, it wasn't Fairbanks itself, it was uh, the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I 
uh, had to work. We we had to go back to work, and it was in October now, early October, and it was not very comfortable putting on cedar shakes. I remember on the house <laughs> at uh, when it was down around ten below during the night and the morning, and uh, it was, uh, we didn't have nail guns in those days. You know, had to do it with your fingers and work gloves. That uh, you had to have some way to warm up your hands again. And uh, when that was paid off, then I realized that this scheme of uh, hunting and fishing lodge, which was tempting, but it was, uh, Tony was not a good businessman, the way he realized, and uh, it was probably 20 years before the right opportunity to do that, and uh, at least. And uh, so then I had decided by now that wildlife management, studying wildlife management, which had a good pro, there was a good program at the University of Connecticut, and I learned. And uh, Dave, how did you even find out about wildlife management as a subject at that time? Um, well, I learned a little bit about in Alaska about game wardens and what and. But I, I, I made an effort to find out about uh, wildlife and management in the, in the other states, and uh, and so I, I read things about it, but I wasn't an ardent reader. I was, I, uh, game wardens, you know, was getting in that close direction, but I. I realized that if you had a university degree, you could be more than a game warden. You could be a biologist working. And I, and I was, at this time, I was focused on ecology and especially mountain ecology and Arctic and northern ecology. And uh, so I was interested in plants as well as animals. And, uh, but alpine, I, I fell in love with that in the, in the Brooks Range. And uh, so then I, I looked into, and the university didn't have, they had a one biology teacher. Uh, the university here in Fairbanks? In Fairbanks. And it was only like 250, 300 students total. And so it was a small, just barely, and uh, then changed, changed the name to a university from School of Mine, Agriculture, School of Agriculture and Mining, or something like that, and uh, the uh, so there was nothing to offer there, and uh, but I and I I was getting probably homesick too to go back and have a family and see my family. My father had died while I was in the Navy. And so uh, my mother and sister and brothers were still there, and uh, in New England. And so I definitely wanted to go back. And so I needed the money, to, and I couldn't just drive back uh, in the beginning of the winter. So I had to find a job, uh, and I uh, went out to the experimental farm because I had this experience with my grandfather's farm, and I thought that would be nice, and it had the interest there as well. And fortunately, they they had a position for a farm worker, and I worked with the dairy. They had a dairy herd then, and I was assistant to this dairyman, which when I, you know, I got to clean out after the cows and <laughs> help with the milking and help with feeding, and and it was very enjoyable work for me. And it turned out it was, although they they didn't pay much, I uh, they provided a building with a with a little wood stove in it and a, a small frame building that had been used for workers in the summertime, and I was able to live there and put a bunk in there and stove and and stayed there, and then and it was and I had to work early in the morning for their for milking and 
in the evening for milking. And so I could put in about eight hours and still have the middle of the day available. So I, I realized I, if I was going back to Connecticut, to, I should uh, get uh, blown up a little bit on courses that I had not done so well in high school on, <laughs> like math and, and uh, chemistry. And uh, so I took some so-called bonehead courses that designed especially for helping me, like things like algebra and what, and because I would have to take exams to get into the University of Connecticut, even though I was a resident there, my grades were not good enough to get in. High school grades were not good enough without taking exams. So I did that, and it was convenient and not a bad way to spend the winter in interior Alaska because I had some sociality with the students at the university and the classes I was taking and the people at the experimental farm that I was working with were good people and, and I enjoyed the work and it was healthy environment and I put up the, put the Model A up on blocks in the shed at the farm, drained the radiator and took the battery out and lived fine. Uh -huh. And so when did you go back to start college? Then the next spring, after the, the plan was to leave as soon as the semester was over and I had lined up a couple of students to, to drive with me over the highway. Yep. Got a call let it, let it, let it well, I'm going to pause. All right, we're back. So you leave Alaska to go back to Connecticut for college. Yeah. We, we were delayed in leaving because it was a, a big uh, a rapid melt off and flooding and what road was washed out between, <coughs> between Fairbanks and Delta and the Alaska Highway, the bridges were out. And so we were delayed about 10 days and we finally got to Whitehorse and the bridge still wasn't repaired, a major bridge on the highway south of uh, Whitehorse. We had to spend two or three days there, which was interesting because they, we were there when they launched the river boats oh, yeah. and the whole village came out and and they, uh, watching that operation was really fun. And the stern uh, wheelers were still running on the yeah, Yukon River. Right, then, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so they made a good splash when they knocked the chocks out and they greased up the oh, yeah. timbers so they would slide down. And they did, and that was nice. And then the, there was one gal, a student, that had to fly from Whitehorse because she stood to be at her sister's wedding, and she had some. Her parents wired her some money so she could fly down. And so the the other guy that was with me, uh, he was going to Portland, and so we took off and went over the highway and on the way up over the highway we had no problems whatsoever, no flat tires. We had one flat tire with a nail in it and but the, everything worked fine almost. And uh, going back it was uh, the way you, we're doing fine and the car was running fine and then it started running on three cylinders and it took a while to figure out why. And it was turned out that uh, one of the pistons had broken just above the rings, and it was pushed up the top of the piston was pushed up the top, so it wouldn't take in the gas and wouldn't fire. So it was only firing on three cylinders. So we took the we had to take the head off and see what was going on, take the top out, and put some metal over the thing to try to keep gas from working its way in there and it wasn't too successful in that but it, we were still able to go on three cylinders over the steepest part so we did a lot of gearing down and then it was downhill to we couldn't find any place that would have any possibility of helping us until we got to Port Nelson where there was a post office a telephone and an airport and they uh, we got advice to call 
Edmonton and get the part sent up by the mail plane after the three or four days, which we did. And the, there was a garage that had a ramp outside, and the, the mechanic was on the on the trunk. But he, uh, we talked to him, and he said we could use his tools, but uh, if we need them, oh, well, we really. We pretty, pretty much had our own tools, but we used the ramp, and that was a challenge because it's right in the middle of the mosquito season. <laughs> but we, when the piston came, we put it back in and put the engine back together again, and then took off down the highway, and we made it to um, International Falls in, uh, it's in northern Idaho, I think. In, uh, Minnesota. No. no. International Falls, oh, Minnesota. Great Falls. No, this is Great Falls. Great Falls. Yeah. What's yeah. no this is a any rate, we get made it to uh, I think either I think it was northern Idaho. Oh, okay. And then we're going to and we're headed for Spokane and uh, and then uh, Portland. And oh, you were going that way. You weren't headed directly back east. No, because I had planned to yeah. go down through uh, California and just visit Yosemite and oh, see you're it. take the long way home. I was going to take the long way home. <laughs> and <laughs> back through the south, which wasn't yeah. so great. At any rate. Uh, well, I'm going to move us along to get you into your education background in wildlife and okay. what you studied. And okay, well, you. back in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I got back there and, and I uh, had decided that I want to uh, do a bachelor's degree in wildlife management and which was the wildlife program was in the, the forestry and wildlife department so it was primarily forestry but they had a wildlife program there so and you did your undergraduate work there as well at university at connecticut yeah 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 not as well no oh. so undergraduate was university of connecticut then master's okay you finished at university. and i did the master's up here i see yeah. Yeah. So then I did that, uh, the undergraduate at the University of Connecticut, and there actually had been uh, one of the first co-op units that had been in Connecticut, but for political reasons, after a couple of years, it, the state didn't support it. Uh, but it um, it got the university started in the wildlife program, and so that was a good program and. Uh, Franklin McCamey was the wildlife prop there, and he was uh, top notch as far as I was concerned, good advisor. And uh, he talked me into doing an honors thesis and uh, studying uh, ecology of a cedar swamp that was only about four miles from the campus. And that was fascinating to me because the cedar swamp had a sort of uh, habitat that had uh, its own place, one of the few places in Connecticut, especially in that part of Connecticut where there were any snowshoe hares. There were uh, there were rabbits, cottontail rabbits, but there were snowshoe hares there, and it was uh, a few houses around it, but uh, the cedar swamp. But it was a fascinating place, and and I learned a lot in the process, and it was uh, a good project. It sounds like that maybe is what got you inspired to do field work. Is that sort of your first experience with field work? No. Yeah, sort of, but I mean, I I didn't have to be inspired, I don't think. I was interested in... You were pretty well hooked by the Brooks Range e by that. I was <laughs> an ecological, understanding yeah. ecological systems was uh -huh. It was good training for me because it was broad, and I, you know, I, I could also do things like uh, uh, build snares to catch a couple of rabbit snowshoe hares to for make study skins for the university uh, uh, comparative anatomy lab, and you know, I could, I could, I'd been in Boy Scouts, and so that was fascinating to be able to capture animals without using firearms or guns. And, and so, yeah, I built some spring 
sets with bent over willows. Don't work too well in real super cold country, mm -hmm. but uh, willows pop up and, and when you trig set the trigger in and get a loop around the, you can make it all out of willow usually. Mm -hmm. And um, boy, I, I did get a couple of hairs and made study skins out of those. And, but did studies on when there was a little bit of snow tracking and and where they were, what areas they were using and why and what, because around the edge of the swamp it was a transition with into broadleaf forests and uh, shrubby zone and and then and some then into either some agriculture and and some houses. Were there deer there at that? There point? were deer yeah. there, but not very many. Mm -hmm. They were there was heavy poaching mm -hmm. deer mm -hmm. in Connecticut. And uh, when I worked in the state forests, there were deer there, and you were lucky if you saw one, but you'd see sign. And, uh, but um, yeah, they were poached pretty heavily, so the population didn't get started. And so after four years at the University in Connecticut, you came to Alaska for graduate school? Yeah, but it was a lesson for, I mean, I was able to finish in about three and a half years because I had some, a couple of credits to transfer from the University of Alaska and some military credits as well. Okay. But then during, while I was uh, as an undergraduate, undergraduate student there when I was a junior or senior, uh, the Korean War started and um, I was suddenly 1A, which I thought that uh, for the draft board, and I thought I'd served my time mm -hmm. in the Second World War, and but I'd only actually been had one year of active duty, and they're required to have under the draft law during the Korean War, you had to have uh, two years of military service, and so I was. Drafted, so I was able to get a deferment as a student, and uh, and then I, when I finished the undergraduate, I wanted to go on for a master's. I realized it was important to get a master's degree for good position, getting a good position in wildlife work, even though you never made big money <laughs> there. But uh, so I. Uh, was able to apply and get admitted to the graduate program that had been established in 1950, the Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit program at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. And uh, it was the University of Alaska period at that time because it was the only campus in the state, you know, the state system. And I was able to get an extension on my uh, the deferment for the master's degree. So then I did the master's degree through the Alaska Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit. And who was the unit leader at that time? The unit leader, the first unit leader was Neil Hosley, who uh, was a sort of senior wildlife from, I think he had worked in Michigan and he would, had done a lot of work with moose habitat studies. And he had published quite a bit and had a good reputation. And he came, and uh, it was he, he. He was the one who who accepted me, uh, largely because of my Alaskan experience and and interest and motivation. And uh, and I would I had a good academic record in, in college that made up for the poor one in high school. <laughs> And, uh, so why did you decide to come to the University of Alaska if their program was so new? Well, it was Alaska one, and I figured it had to be good in Alaska, and it would be, I had my heart on Alaska. But I applied to other places, so I think the University of uh, Utah State, I think, and at uh, Idaho. Which I I checked in. I was definitely interested in 
as alternatives, the mountains, the Rockies, and or Pacific Northwest, if if I couldn't come, get funding to come to Alaska. So, unfortunately, in one regard, uh, Hosley re replied and said, "Yeah, they would like to have me come, but their funding wouldn't. Uh, they didn't have any funding for the first year, and so if they could come and." I'll find a job or something, but they would have a stipend for the second year, and so then I uh, I had been shortlisted for a position at both uh, Utah and uh, Idaho, and uh, the Idaho was working with uh, sage grouse, I think, and the Utah I forgot what it was. And uh, but I had a positive response from from Idaho saying that they probably would have the funding and th that they were narrowing it down and they and that they would like to have me come. But this was after uh, that, just before I got the response from Alaska from Neil Hosley, and so they would have had. Full funding if I went to Idaho, but I figured, no, <laughs> I'll go to Alaska and find work or something. And uh, so I wrote to both Utah and Idaho and said I decided to go to Alaska, and which I did. Um, did you already have in mind that you wanted to study deer and caribou and no, muskox? But I I knew I knew. That I would uh, not have free choice; that I might have to accept what was available. Uh, but I'd, on the other hand, I had been hooked on alpine ecology, and certainly I thought, you know, alpine ungulates uh, would be I'd be very happy working with them. But I was interested in the plant-animal relationship, and, the, and I had a good. Uh, I could several botany courses, systematics and other, and was very interested in, in botany and plant ecology as well. And so uh, I thought, well, it would work out well. But fortunately, uh, Neil Hosley, who was then the unit leader, uh, I told him, yes, I would come. and. Uh, I don't know whether I said anything about. I said I would have to find work, but then I said I would like, you know, if, I, if he knew of any work for the summer, I, I could come earlier. Well, then I got a telegram saying there was this position as a, a field assistant for the, in the Kenai Moose Range, where Dave Spencer was a refuge manager and the only other paid position was a uh, maintenance man, and th they w had this position for summer temporary. But I had to be up there in about five days. <laughs> so I uh, figured, wow, a job, that'd be great. And so I flew up to Anchorage, borrowed some money from my mother, <laughs> and flew up. To uh, Anchorage, and uh, and then Dave Spencer flew up from Kenai and picked me up after a day or two, and went back to the Kenai and spent that first summer. And that was that was very important for me and where uh, what my career and education. How did you fly up to Alaska, Dave? I'm just curious. You know. so, there was a, a DC what six that flew from Seattle to uh, Annette Island, okay, yeah. and refueled, yeah. and then continued on up to Anchorage. Okay, yeah. And of course, I, I crossed country. I forget where I flew, flew out of. Uh, I probably flew out of Hartford to uh, New York. Or someplace, mm -hmm. 
Alts or Chicago. Probably and, also on a DC-6 at that time. Yeah, so, uh, right. Six. And uh, so... So working with Dave Spencer at the Kenai Range was important for you. It was terrific because he, I mean, he was surely short-handed there and, and he had, as reference manager, his wife, he was married, they hadn't started the family yet, but uh, had that in mind, I'm sure, and but he was such a good pilot, and uh, that, and he had a Grumman Widgeon there, based in um, Kenai, and the headquarters at that time was right next to the Kenai runway, and uh, so he did a lot of flying for the other refugees in Alaska and for waterfowl work, and. So he was gone a lot, but he, he when I came, he said, well, uh, I, I, he knew that I had had quite a bit of botany. And he said, well, we want to start a, an herbarium and so you can do plant collecting, but we've got, uh, we want to build the first public campground out in Skelac Lake. And uh, that's a, a when they built the road to uh, to Moose Pass, so that the railroad you could drive there and take a railroad to Anchorage, uh, there was no road to, to Anchorage. But uh, then uh, the, the the gravel road also they made a spur out to well it went close the old road went close to Skelac, but they had a spur of a mile and a half or so to the lake, and there they had bulldozer just pushed up roots and trees and stuff and but it was a place where you could launch a boat and uh, gravel beach and plan was to clean that out all that debris and make campgrounds uh, start to make campgrounds and so I got assigned to and with a tent and, and stove and and just place uh, to uh, live in a tent and they had a boat I was outboard and if the weather was good I could take the boat and go mostly across the lake and then climb up into the mountains and collect plants and then the mountains you go up into mountain sheep and mountain goat habitat and uh, and then I'd come back and and to put the plants in the plant place and and if it was windy or not good weather for foggy and you went know, going the mountains I could just uh, do do the woods work around there and and then Dave Spencer would come back from the field he'd come out and help me with the work and uh, so uh, it was but your main job was actually building the campground out there was that uh, well I was that was a little that everything. was for me to do when I wasn't Needed to do other yeah. things, and so then, yeah. then they wanted me. Uh, Bob Scott was uh, working for the Fish and Wildlife as a mountain sheep guy. He was based in Anchorage, and he wanted. Uh, he had been doing some work in uh, the Kenai Mountains on mountain sheep, at the head of uh, the mountains, at the head of Tusamina Lake, and he would built a little. Uh, uh, a tent camp with a wood floor and uh, and a, so that and frame so it could go through the winter or the wall all tent over it and with a wood stove right up there in the right at the beginning of the alpine zone and so he had done some work you know he was working his intention was to do a PhD through the University of British Columbia on mountain sheep. Mm. Mm -hmm. But he was working full time uh, for Fish and Wildlife. He had a master's degree from Oregon State in Wildlife. And that uh, was a pretty advanced degree at that time for Alaska biologists. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, so I had instructions on how to do the uh, counts of uh, ULAM ratios in the Indian Creek area. Mm -hmm. There, and it's a terrific area, and it was just 
Dave Swenser flew me up to a little lake about halfway up from Tuscamina and uh, with the widgeon and then then I and we airdropped some uh, uh, food and and uh, so I didn't have too much to carry up there and uh, then I just took my camping gear and, and stuff and uh, then uh, then when I got up there the one thing he forgot was a plant press because they wanted it. Scott and he both wanted plant clacking up there too. So he said, well, he was going to be able to fly over in a day or two and he could drop me plant press. And that was an interesting experience because <clears throat> he, uh, it was, he, he whether it's uh, fogged in and so he couldn't come uh, the, uh, when he was planned, when he said he would likely come. And and I woke up in the morning in the sand and it snowed just about this much. And so there was snow over all over the willows and stuff. And, uh, and uh, but the, it was lifting. And so finally I, I thought, well, he'll probably make it if it lifts enough. But even before the clouds had lifted, I heard the plane and he came in and he had a, didn't have too much room between the clouds and where he was going to drop it, which was just as well, but he knew the area. And, but he was by himself in this widgeon, and uh, he <clears throat> was made this swoop, and I thought, I could see he was trying to push the plant press out of the window, and what happened, the strap got caught around the stick, I think, and so the flame <laughs> went like this. He straightened it out, and he made another loop, and the second time he had pushed it, in. And we had all rigged up with uh, some cloth uh, that would, uh, like a tail, so that when it hit the ground, it would, it wouldn't go down the brush. And so he pushed all this cloth out first, and then the wind just pulled the whole thing out and stripped the the deals off. And so all of these papers and blotters <laughs> came down <laughs> into this wet snow. And scattered all over the area. So it took you the rest of the day to put the plant press back together. <laughs> I had, unfortunately, it was a sunny day, and, but I didn't dry it all out completely. I put it behind the stove and the blotters and stuff and the cardboards. And uh, I picked up quite a bit before they got too bad. And, but Some then, of the adventures I, of And then Dave yeah. told me, he said, that was a mistake on his part. <laughs> going to say some of the adventures of early field work. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another thing I did with Dave was uh, he was doing some with a widgeon, which is a little faster than you needed for mountain uh, counting from the air. So and I was, by this time, I was beginning to think, uh, well, I was falling in love with working with alpine ungulates for sure. And, uh, but here was, I was learning a lot doing some of Scott's stuff. He had already set up some exclosures where, uh, that where the sheep had, were doing a lot of heavy grazing to see what the effect would be on plants. And he made it all out of locally harvested alders. And some were keeping the sheep away and you could see a difference already. Uh, and uh, at any rate, uh, I was <clears throat> learning a lot about sheep, and and then I knew if I hiked further up, close to the glacier, that it should be goats. And yeah, I went up there and spotted some goats, and got a little familiar with the goats and the kind of habitat they were in. And so that was I was I was definitely thinking strongly about that, but I didn't. I still hadn't got to the university to start a program. So in the meantime, then uh, Neil Hosley, the first unit leader, was talked into taking the deanship of the, uni of the university, the dean of students. And well, it was a good position for him, and uh, he, he loved it in Alaska, and this 
wife and had a son that was almost ready to begin the university. So who became dean of the, or head of the cooperative? Okay, then they had, the part of the deal in establishing the Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit was the university would hire one person to teach wildlife uh, biology and management. And, and so then uh, they uh, hired uh, John Buckley, who was, uh, had a doctorate from the University of New York, Sunny at Syracuse, I think. And uh, so he then had, so he had a, some experience there and, and he became unit leader. So then they hired, as a backup position, the university hired Jim Reardon to teach uh, wildlife courses. So, uh, so the John Buckley then officially came, became my advisor, although Hosley was sort of acted a little bit of an advisor at first, uh, and he was, he was still teaching court wildlife courses too. Uh, so uh, that, then it was up to me to convince Buckley that uh, Alpine ungulates, I, I wanted to work with Alpine ungulates, and that since uh, Scott was covering mountain sheep, mountain goats were available. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Buckley, uh, his focus was on fur bear uh, and waterfowl uh, wetlands, and mainly, and it made sense at that brand new unit, which didn't have much funding, and uh, to focus on Minnow Lakes, where they they built a cabin, log cabin, and was able to, and then Brian Kessel had been hired as a just to work on, and she was, her interest was, water, was waterfowl and birds. So uh, he, uh, most of the students at that time, like there were about five students through the unit then, most of them were doing projects out there on fur bears or uh, not necessarily always out there, but on beaver, a lot of those you could work here out of Fairbanks and the Chattanooga and other areas and and uh, was anybody for, working on moose or caribou? No, at that time it was sort of like uh, those big ungulates were uh, covered by uh, biologists working for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Mm -hmm. So Ed Chatelain was based in Anchorage, but he mainly was responsible for moose but also things like bison mm -hmm. and delta, and mm -hmm. and these these were well trained and well high, 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 and it's terrific uh, scientists and biologists, and uh, so they were doing, you know, both management, but the the studies. Well, that's, we need to know as much as we can about the ecologies of animals if we're going to manage mm -hmm. them, and that's one of the the things that was important to the Fish and Wildlife Service and the early start of uh, development of wildlife management in Alaska is that the federal government had responsibility for the habitat and understanding the relationship of these animals to their habitat. And in the case of moose, that's sort of all important. Uh, and alpine things, uh, animals, you just you figured, well, it, you don't have to manipulate the habitat, so it's not so important. To, and the same with caribou. You know, they do their thing, and you don't. Mm -hmm. You should know what the relationship is, but we didn't know then how important habitat was, and they were beginning to show this importance. And that's one of the, one of the points that I feel like emphasizing is that uh, then the transition to statehood was, uh, uh, by that time I had finished my master's, served a year in the Army, was drafted to serve a year in the Army and stayed in Alaska, and then I got a full-time job as a 
pollophologists working, uh, management biologists, I guess they were called then, working in southeast Alaska with deer ecology. And that was at Petersburg. Based in Petersburg, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. But it was responsible for all of southeast sort of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the ter that was for the territorial department of fish and game, or what was or the, it was the state. It was still the territory. So I, in uh, still for fish and wildlife fish service. And yeah. Okay. It was uh, technically uh, the you were working for both the territorial uh, game commission and the fish and wildlife service, and the the chair non-voting chair of the Game Commission was the head of the Fish and Wildlife Service for Alaska. That was Clarence Road when I was uh, doing that work. And, but the Game Commission was four or five senior guys, included a uh, medical doctor in Fairbanks and a uh, fur buyer from Nome, uh, a guide, hunter guide from the Kenai, and then I guess there was another one. That there was a hunter a fellow who would was not hard a hunter, but uh, he he in a fish cannery and uh, he had been a commercial fisherman and fish cannery and. Mm -hmm. And so, but he was an ardent hunter and fisherman. The, the fact that you were so interested in habitat and the plant-animal connection, was that typical for wildlife managers at the time? And people it was typical for a federal government uh, biologist. Uh, although, as usual, I mean, they had to, to do surveys and try to estimate numbers and things like moose and caribou, where especially in areas where there's there was hunting pressure, like uh, the Nanchina area, where a road accessible from Anchorage and Fairbanks, and and then moose in the in the Susitna Valley and in Interior Alaska and other places, rural areas where mostly native hunters, subsistence hunters, and uh, there wasn't much effort at that time to, uh, to do wildlife management for the, with, uh, to serve the interests of native people. So the game regulations frequently were not appropriate for Caribou, for example, season might open before they could keep the, uh, or wouldn't open, say, until uh, uh, the weather was getting cool. And, but it uh, wasn't tuned to keeping and preserving the meat by the native people. And so, in the case of caribou, it's when the caribou were in their ver their area, and whereas uh, for urban hunters, they had to access the caribou via the Cease Highway or the Taylor Highway, primarily, and that was before there was a lot of fly-in kind of hunting, and uh, so it was uh, uh, natives. In fact, they weren't. There was, I think, they hadn't didn't even require natives in territorial days to have licenses, or they may have established some, the state legislature and at twenty five cents or something, and of course a lot of natives just wouldn't bother, and they, and there was nobody checking on it, so it was like the attitude is well we have to train these people to. Uh, live by regulations because these harvests have to be shared between natives and non-natives. And, uh, but the subsistence issue wasn't considered a serious one uh, at the time because it was private statehood 
and the state, uh, the territory, didn't have everything was had to go through the federal government to begin with. It was like waste and one killing or something like that. So the the game wardens were confronted with things like stopping the natives from using uh, rawhide snares for kill moose because they put a lot of them out and uh, they might not get to them before wolves would chew, chew them up or something if they got caught in the snare or the an animal would not be killed right away and they might, because of bad weather, not be able to get out there with their dog teams and find it and things like that. And then the waterfowl, the migratory waterfowl, the natives hunted when they wanted them and when they were available. And they were frequently not available when the natives were um, could get them. They weren't, they, the seasons wouldn't open until first of September and, and where the waterfowl were breeding, they were gone usually by that time. So that made the natives who hunted them, hunting them illegally out of season. Yep, that one there was a big controversy by this time, but it was the federal government, see, because it's a migratory waterfowl. And, uh, and then after statehood, you know, then the, the state didn't want to get into that controversy, uh, the, the, the federal government. And, and that was a separate issue, which was, it took a lot of uh, uh, learning on the part of the federal government the Fish and Wildlife Service on how to get compliance because this is international law and they were supposed to, according to the treaty with, treaty with Canada and, and Texas, they were supposed to, uh, no, in New Mexico, or Mexico rather, mm -hmm. yeah. It was uh, supposed to, I mean, from the standpoint of it being international, it was important for conservation of waterfowl because there was extreme killing of birds in Canada and and Mexico and Alaska out of season. And Mexico was making progress in this and so was Canada, but Alaska was one of the most critical ones because we had this tremendously rich, air, these rich areas for waterfowl production. And traditionally native people have had used them and it's frequently tied into say muskrat hunting in the springtime and that was important to get cash income for the natives. And this was after the long winter when their fish that they had caught in the previous summer where supply was pretty much gone. And then in those areas they didn't have moose or caribou available. But so those, something was done to change those laws so that the native people hunting them were no longer doing it illegally. That's yep. very recent, though. That's recent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, there was a lot of attempts to try to change these, and and they had to go through the State Department because it's international. And in Canada, and especially the prairie provinces that produce a lot of waterfowl and were come, uh, controlling harvest, but and they didn't. They had similar problems in the Arctic, but they didn't have this high numbers like we have. Well, I was wondering is what happened in the wildlife management community to get people to start understanding they needed to make this change? In well, the laws. in the case of the migratory birds, I mean, that was coming down from Washington that, well, we've got to comply because we try to get a, some modification in the treaty with Canada and and it was it was it wouldn't work because the province some of the provinces said no they wouldn't go along with uh, letting any spring hunting go on and uh, for waterfowl there were other th other things that were traditionally had been done like uh, harvest of uh, eggs and which was a sort of like a community activity uh, women and children and and uh, and drives of flightless birds when the young were big enough to be quite just beginning or almost ready to fly and the adults were 
lost their fly feathers and molting. Then you could have these tribes where one or two villages would get together and you could kill, you know, hundreds and hundreds of birds. And uh, the thought of that by, the, the controversy was really between uh, over rather, the native taking them sort of out of season and taking, producing birds <laughs> versus sport hunters and wintering areas, especially geese in uh, Oregon and Washington wintering there and the uh, sport hunters, you know, didn't want restrictions on them when the natives were doing all these things out of season, et cetera, et cetera. So that was, that was a difficult uh, effort. And then there was a, a few deals where the word came down from Washington we just can't let these natives go out and do the spring hunting. They would were announcing that there was, you know, getting word out that it was illegal to take them in the spring. Well, the people aren't weren't going to stop. And then they were. Then they had a couple of shootouts. One was in Bethel, and so these were young natives that were, were just took their boat across the river and started hunting waterfowl with. Well, you know, that, that was a tough one. And then the worst one was, uh, I know the enforcement agents and, you know, they were flying, they were required to be out there flying and, and there was some natives, uh, a couple of guys with a dog team that had gone out to hunt waterfowl from the village. So they were only out on the Yukon Cuscoon Delta. I forget, it, was, it might've been, It wasn't Chebac, but it was uh, Tansatuliak, I think. And uh, they uh, set care of these guys with uh, geese and, and their dog team and the camp. And uh, well, they, they, well, they didn't have a camp, they just were blind because they'd come out from the village and they were only about three miles from the village. And so the planes circled around and so these guys hitched up their dog and headed for the village as fast as they could go. And so they were going to land there with skis and, but they had taken off. And so they circled around and, and they, they landed at, the, they, these guys arrived at the village before they could land and so they landed and the whole village came out with these guys and they were confronted with the whole village and they were they realized they, they just better just leave which they did there wasn't any gunfire that one but it was you know, they the law enforcement he couldn't just Force of law in that kind of situation, and then then we had the deal at Barrow with the, the with the eider ducks okay. and. So we had you working on deer in southeastern Alaska, and somehow you went to get your PhD at the University of British Columbia, right? Yeah. Um, that. Um, and that PhD was on Arctic undulates again. No. No, it was on deer. Okay. And as I was working down there, I was starting some research projects because I was uh, looking at habitat relationships. I was using, build up some enclosures to protect uh, vegetation in old growth situations and in open areas. And uh, I was starting to learn stuff about that and then I was fascinated by the fact that uh, some of the deer, the deer on some islands were different deer on other islands. And there were, some of the biggest deer were on an island close to Wrangell, which is close to the mainland and close to the Stikine River, or coming through the, from British Columbia. And then uh, there were super, super small uh, deer out on, uh, Coronation Island, 
which is a re pretty remote place. It's now a wilderness area within the fish and wildlife, within the forest service. And there, there were also no wolves on the Coronation Island and no bears. And, uh, and so there was no, the, the deer were small and that didn't have, they didn't have as much alpine area per percentage of the island as the Warren Kofsky. Warren Kofsky had a lot of uh, lush alpine, but it also, and then had fairly steep slopes, but in normal winter, the deer would come down as the snow accumulated up in the alpine and they would plenty of forage in a tough winter the snow would get deeper there than out on the outside island where it was much milder climate. And so it was a lot of rain instead of snow and deer could stay up high and, 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 but they also, I was, it was obvious they were over grazing and using and browsing the vegetation. And so a lot of the prime forage species were, were absent and, uh, whereas out in on Warren Coffee, you no, know, in a tough winter, the forage wasn't overgrazed because the snow was too deep and the deer died of starvation, a lot of them. But the wolves could get there too by swimming from other islands, which they frequently did. And, and when the, after a severe winter, the population was knocked way down but then it bounced back rapidly because it was such a lush environment. So this is what your PhD was about? Then? Yeah, comparing the deer and the vegetation on these two islands. And the reason I got involved with uh, uh, University of British Columbia was uh, the, I had some connections. I did a organized uh, and sold the idea to my advisor that I should be able to make a trip to Vancouver Island where there was a lot of logging going on and we hadn't had much logging. We we're just starting to get it in Alaska and uh, where they had good deer populations and to visit with their biologists for that portion of Vancouver Island or whole of Vancouver Island, I guess, a guy named Robinson. and. So I made the trip down there and they paid for my travel and, uh, and uh, Robinson hosted my visit and, and toured me around and I made connections then with the work that was being done on deer in British Columbia, which is another subspecies of the mule deer separate from the Sitka blacktail. And uh, so when I, then the, the professor at the University of British Columbia, uh, Ian McTaggart Cowan, who was uh, a senior person who had done just fabulous wildlife work, worked with Ron Sheep and published on uh, deer and clams and birds and like anything you can think of. And just a top notch person and uh, he was, already knew he was uh, a good advisor because uh, Bob Scott had started a PhD there and Jim Brooks had also started one but didn't finish because both of them were so busy with uh, their work in Alaska, they couldn't spend the time. And, uh, but at any rate, uh, they, I, he, Cowan contacted my supervisor in, in Juneau and Pete Nelson about could he get uh, some, if there were, somebody picked up the fawns and mistakenly took them into captivity and what would, you, what would he normally do with them? Well, we had a problem in Petersburg too. Somebody would be out the road and there would be a fawn and, and it was a newborn and the doe had ran off and they'd pick it up and bring it back in and say, and give it to Fish and Game or to Fish and Wildlife, to me. Mm -hmm. And so 
there was a fur farm that had an association with the university in Petersburg, and they had a big fenced area around these pens where they had foxes and and uh, mink, and we could uh, we could uh, take the fawn out there and bottle feed it for a while, get somebody to bottle feed it. There was usually people out there that would bottle feed it, and then eventually but let it go into the wild. But the problem is they frequently were hooked on people. So, and you know, if we just, what can you do with a fawn like that? And we couldn't spend the time, I'll always, my wife did at times and I did, we did it together a couple of times uh, until we got something worked out. And so, Nelson contacted me from Juno and said, yeah, if, if you could get something, we could maybe get them down. So we, we did uh, ship down, I think, four Sitka black-tailed deer fawns uh, separately. When we had them, we would uh, uh, let him know by telephone. And uh, it was a complicated deal, but they, he was persistent about, you just send them to Seattle and we'll drive down with some grad students or somebody and pick them up and bring them back to and Vancouver. And what was he doing to do with them? Well, they had a captive animals and they were doing comparing growth and, and behavior and physiology of Sitka blacktail the, and then the uh, Columbia blacktail in D.C. and then the California blacktail down in uh, Southern California in quite different habitats. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, they yeah, they got these Sitka black tails down there and uh, we didn't lose any. So we making these put them in big cardboard boxes with a lot of, uh, we had to get approval from the airlines and they had to be flown in a, at that time in a Grumman Goose to Ketchikan and then a Net Island and then they could get on a DC uh, three, uh, six uh, to Seattle, and then Cowan. We had to let Cowan know when we were doing this, and get and and they the airline said, you know, as long as you have people there to be sure they get taken care of properly, and we'd get someone from get you can get over and help get them on the be sure they got the transferred properly. So do you, you did your PhD at the same time you were working in Petersburg? No, uh, yes and no. Uh, 59 was when statehood came. And uh, so when statehood came, uh, the, there was going to be a new uh, transfer of management of wildlife to the state. And so the state was just getting started and had a, they had a department, state department of fisheries about two years before statehood. And then they just built that department of fish and game and created a game division, which then later became division of wildlife conservation, but a game division. And uh, then uh, the head of that game division was Jim Brooks who had been working for the state or the territorial fisheries doing marine mammal studies. And he was uh, moved into the position as director of the game division. Well, he was a fellow student here with me and I knew him well. And uh, so were a lot of other people that were working with fish and wildlife. Uh, and they transferred Simbra, uh, Ron Skoog sort of fell in a category, but not quite the same because he did this tour in Africa for his PhD. But uh, then uh, there were others, uh, the other Robert Rausch uh, was a student here and transferred and, uh, and um, Will Troyer was uh, working as a game warden he had a master's from Montana, I think it was, but 
he took a game warden job because he went to work in Alaska and when statehood came he was able to move into a refuge position and uh, and so you also you transferred from fish and wildlife to the state division yep but I by this time I had know that I wanted to go back to school and get a PhD but I also had a wife and two kids and uh, so uh, I agreed to work for Fish and Game if they would uh, I would stay there in Petersburg initially and continue the their studies but which were, would be part of my PhD dissertation but I would take uh, leave without pay, but called educational leave to in the new uh, uh, ADFNG uh, to spend the, the, the required residence time at the University of British Columbia, which is two years, two academic years. And so then in the summer, I'd go down there and, with the whole family, and, and the family would move to Walla Walla, where my wife was from with the kids and I uh, would come back to Alaska and continue the deer work and uh, and then they had hired a guy to fill Harry Merriam to fill my position and so he worked as a field assistant on my finishing up the deer studies and uh, as well as they had others that could work with me which was really worked out real well. So when did you finish your PhD? Well then I finished the the academic requirements and I had almost finished field work uh, essentially finished the field work when uh, they uh, Christian came wanted me to come back and because uh, uh, I had to go somewhere <laughs> and uh, and so the job they had for me was in Juneau, which was heading up uh, the coordination of the fish and, or for the uh, um, Pittman Robertson uh, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Conservation Fish and Wildlife. What's that? Federal Aid for, for Wildlife Conservation and Management, which is a federal law and Pittman and Robertson are the members of Congress who pushed it through, and they took uh, 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 a, a tax on firearms and ammunition, and that uh, money was used, distributed throughout the states, and the new state, uh, the territory even got a little bit for, but you got a portion in relationship to the number of hunting lessons sold in the state versus the size. So we had, uh, even though we had a lot of hunters for our population, we didn't have very many compared to New York and Texas, and, but we got, Alaska got the maximum amount because we're of all of the, uh, the size of Alaska. And so uh, it was, uh, that was a major support for the wildlife. Uh, management work and associated biological studies. So was your job to help distribute the funds around Alaska? My job was to be the administrator for uh, the, uh, the, the funds and budgeting, but also visiting some of the research projects. So I did get to travel around uh, the state and visit some of the projects and uh, so that mainly to be sure you're meet, meeting the standards required. But there was uh, excellent uh, people that were hired. There were a lot of young people, students that had coming with degrees, which was unusual from uh, the way it had been in the old days. Yeah, you mentioned that before, that wildlife managers or game wardens previously didn't have advanced degrees very much? Well, some of them didn't, and some of them came into it indirectly, that they were like uh, sometimes a game warden might have a, be inclined to 
in addition to doing their job, to get the information on num relative numbers and things that were needed for management. And so they sometimes game wardens were doing the same, same things as, as biologists, and sometimes not at all. And so it was, that's the way it was in the old days. I mean, there's some of the early people that were doing fabulous work, like the first real biologists were people that were sent up here, like Aldous Murray, sent up from, from the lower 48, from Wyoming, to study the caribou. And so it wasn't the territory, it was the federal government that had, had approved the budget for him. And the same when he went out into the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern Aleutian Islands. Sometimes it was tied with human activities, like in the Aleutians, uh, the foxes were, uh, red foxes occur na naturally out onto as far as Umnak Island. Uh, and uh, so it's on, on Alaska where Dutch Harbor is and on Alaska. And on Alaska, and um, the uh, well, and the, so someone he was uh, went out there because you know well, what what's this is this an important bird protection area? But then we've got foxes introduced by the Russians on the islands further out, the Arctic foxes, and uh, and yet this this economy based on this because the natives. The Russians, of course, were uh, started putting foxes out there, and Americans continued to do it after it became uh, territory under the U.S. And uh, some of the natives were this was a good source of cash income to trap uh, foxes on the islands that, and they were living off the birds and the chicks and stuff. <laughs> but you know, and so you know, some of Mary's requirements were. Well, what what are the highest priority to, from the native standpoint, uh, and what about these others? Where if we get rid of the foxes, it would help the birds, and it wasn't going to hurt somebody. And that's for the Arctic's. I mean, it was approached, and then on Umnak and uh, on Alaska, there were ranchers out there with sheep and what, and they didn't like red foxes because they killed some of the newborn lambs, and so they wanted predator and rodent control out there. And they, yeah, they'd go out there and poison or kill foxes and shoot them, mostly, I guess, foxes. And and so it was, but on the other hand, you know, these were uh, natural areas. And then, you know, what, what, is, what, what is the role of the foxes there? So that's where it takes, it took somebody like, Murray could go out there and, and do studies on just what the foxes were eating. Mm -hmm. Like it turns out the the red foxes weren't killing many birds, they were eating voles. And there were a lot of voles that far out, but beyond that there weren't any voles. Which does lead to the question of when do you manage and when do you not manage oh, yeah. species? That as wildlife managers you have to think about. Right? Yeah, but you have to the history of uh, of wildlife management in North America has been uh, during the early pioneering days. I mean, obviously the homesteaders and what lived off the land as much as possible, and uh, they that was the urban people who would, were doing the over hunting usually, of and killing off the uh, passenger pigeon and. Uh, and waterfowl, they were the ones that were harvesting. They were because there were no bag limits and at first, and and the, with deer, they were over hunted. But especially in New England, you know, they were over hunted. Then a lot of the marginal farms were abandoned and went back to deer habitat, and uh, the deer didn't come back because there was so much hunting pressure. Well. Then they established a buck law, you know, and, and figured, well, you never kill the females because they produce young deer. And so then the buck law 
was transferred up to Alaska in Southeast, uh, the Sig Olson, who I replaced, he was the first biologist, wildlife biologist on the Fish and Wildlife Service for Southeast Alaska working with deer. And his job was to get rid of the damn bucklaw because they had deer were coming out of their teeth in some places and there were so many of them and the, the predator and rodent control people of the federal government were killing wolves because they killed deer. And, uh, and the, the only hunting was where you could get to by boat from villages. And so there were vast areas that you didn't get people, you know, the occasional people out. And so it was a different era. And uh, they, you know, they, I have a, somewhere in my office a, a copy of, uh, that was copied, a report by a game warden that was sent up to, uh, to Alaska because they had heard that there was just wanton killing of deer and stuff. And he came up by st steamship and uh, he got to Petersburg, which was settled by Norwegian fishermen and there was, uh, there were natives, a few natives, but they were, most of the natives were in Cake and other places, but they were also some, uh, fat, uh, uh, um, fish processing, uh, places where, uh, the, uh, canneries where they were hired there were some, a few natives, but it was some of them were Filipinos and others were imported to work there. But they were considered natives; if they weren't Americans. Yeah. And and here was this Norwegian fishing community, and they came up through on this steamship through Wrangell Narrows, and he saw all these people out harvesting the deer. The deer were forced down there because there were there was a big population, and there were. Where the snows were deep and they were starving to death and the, uh, they were out there and there were some few natives I think and but probably Filipinos and others that they this guy thought were natives and then there were Norwegians and so he wrote up in his report he had stopped at other villages and he didn't see this going on because the deer were right in the Wrangell Narrows there you, you saw all this and where there was high population there too, in South in Ketchikan, there probably wasn't that many deer around. And he says, you know, Petersburg is one of the custodist towns, and uh, there's so much wanton killing of animals. And he, he saw these boats coming in; these are rowboats, <laughs> and with just loaded with deer carcasses. Well, there was a whole group of hunters going out, and, and he said. It's a it's a custodious town that he knows of in Alaska, and and it was all coastal towns he knew about, and uh, and the the it's just a bunch of savages out there, and and the goddamn Norwegians, and uh, he he said the only the only white man in in uh, in uh, Petersburg. Now, when he said that white man, you know, he knew that the Norwegians were considered white. So the only white man in Petersburg was Sing Lee, the Chinese guy that ran a restaurant. <laughs> All the rest were outlaws and bandits. <laughs> That's amazing. So I want to get us to your work with the Cooperative Wildlife Unit here at the University in Fairbanks. Pardon? Your work with the cooperative unit here at the University in Fairbanks, how you got that position and what you did in that position. Well, there's a lot of coincidences. And uh, when I came back to Juneau, I still had to write up my thesis. And I got a start on it, but I that was what was remaining. I had to, had to write the thesis. And so, you know, I figured I would have to work evenings and stuff. And I couldn't, you know, I, I had to do my job for a fish and game. That was a full-time job. And, and that was, uh, 
So I, I was making progress. I worked at home in the evenings, and I wasn't as bad as being away from home. <laughs> and it didn't get as much done because of the small kids. And But it, I was making progress. And then in... Uh, so I started in... Uh, yeah, in June or so, well, probably the beginning of July, just as, as the fiscal year was starting. So I came in to that, and we that was you know, kind of adventure because we had a VW bug, which was great uh, for when my wife was down there. I bought it when we went to start the uh, university, and so she had the transportation to... And we, here we see we had transportation, and then, so then we decided to, we got this, uh, they wanted me to take this position in Juneau, and to begin, be, be there in the beginning of July. Well, I was pushing it, because how do you get your car there? Well, we drove to Carcross, and it was in springtime, so they put the car on a flat car, on in car cross and we had to get up around four thirty in the morning and go up because they wanted to, the train to go through before the hot weather the sunny weather created avalanches and uh, because they had to keep so following this was these to take it down to Skagway to Skagway and then there was a, took a ferry there to Juneau so we got there that way and it was it was fun. Kids, yes, that was a wonderful experience so for the kids. You worked in Juno for uh, how long? One year, and uh, so then, uh, sort of about the beginning of the calendar year, I was approached by the Fish and Wildlife Service because uh, what had happened in the wildlife unit was Bob Scott had become unit leader, and. Uh, Buckley had gone to uh, Was Washington. He uh, got a position was sort of like advisory to the president in wildlife ecology. And so Scott got the position. Well, they had, Scott uh, had commitments too. And he was working out of Anchorage and at the time. And so he, for a while, they had a, they got a unit leader from someplace else to come up for a month or two or three from Pennsylvania. I know uh, Jim Binkley, I think it was, something like that. And he loved it. And they offered him the position, but his wife <laughs> loved Pennsylvania too much. And so he couldn't come. And then finally, Bob Scott took the position, and he was certainly well qualified. And uh, he hadn't finished his PhD, but he had so much good positive experience, and the sheep work he'd done was just terrific. And so he took the position, and so then they, uh, he was. Then they, they offered him another position in Washington, partly because he was having an alcohol problem. He had some, went through a period when his family broke up. And, they, and uh, so they offered him a position in Washington, and he got into records work, and he became shortly, got rid of the alcoholism and, and became uh, manager for the refuges for the country, whole country. But, um, so that opened that position again, and, and then they had to get somebody else to come up for a short time, and Fred Dean was an acting uh, unit leader for a short time, but uh, he was a professor there, and so they asked me if I would uh, uh, be interested, and Scott had recommended me, and uh, so I said, 
I couldn't do it because I had taken this position and I had, I had to stick it out because I, uh, the, they were dependent upon me and I couldn't just walk away from that. And so I figured, and I hadn't finished my PhD yet. <laughs> so I continued to work on that and then finally springtime they came back again and wanted to know if uh, I would consider coming and I said, I, no, I'm going to have to stay here at least through the fiscal year. And Well, they said, what, if, what about after that? And then I, I went and talked to Jim Brooks and he said, but I talked to him earlier and I told him I wasn't, I, I wasn't planning to go there. And then I told him that, had a good talk with him and he said, well, he thinks the best place for me would be there and I should take the opportunity to go. So I, I told him I would stay through the budgeting and then I would come. And so what year was that that you came to Fairbanks? 62. And what's your assessment? You were there from 62 till, you ran the unit till 91? No, um, I'll have to look that one up. When did I retire? It was 97, I think. Maybe 91, yeah. In 91, the, the fishery unit had become established in the 80s, and we were separate units, fishery and wildlife. And then there was a lot of pressure to merge the two from the federal standpoint, which they were doing throughout the country mostly. And it made some sense in terms of funding and, and administration. And uh, so I uh, held out uh, because they were one of the reasons for merging them was to reduce the number of people. You don't have one year later then. Mm -hmm. And instead of two, and we had assistant year leaders, one assistant year leader for wildlife and one for fisheries. And so they would, by merging, they would reduce it. And I said, this is Alaska, we can't, we should have more than one assistant year leader. We should have more federal government people uh, in the units in Alaska. And uh, so they finally said uh, they wanted me to be the unit leader for the merged units. And I said, because I had seniority over Jim Reynolds, who was a fisher guy. And I said, no, I, I'm not gonna be the administrator for the combined units. <laughs> I wanted to continue with my own research, my own graduate student support program, et cetera, et cetera. So they then created the position of senior scientists with the merge unit, and we were able to keep all of the, our positions. And in fact, we had already tentatively been approved additional unit leader, assistant unit leader positions in the wildlife program. And, uh, but they, they said, you know, they couldn't fill those because the budget, federal budget was so tight. None of the positions and some of the unit leader positions had to remain vacant because people had retired or left. So and as a senior scientist, you were able to continue with graduate students and more or less as you had before, but you had less administrative a, responsibility. A, a, yeah. Somewhat less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I still had. Some for my own students, I definitely yeah. mm -hmm. had to work on that. So how does that work? The cooperative unit, you was the Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, it, you were teaching at the university. Well, there technically the the unit leaders, the federal uh, employees, have a, a faculty appointment. We had a contract with the university. And the faculty appointment, uh, you had to, they, you cost 
there was one buck involved, I think. So they did, they didn't, the university didn't have any responsibility for salary mm -hmm. or uh, for, they didn't have responsibility for things like a, t a tenure and uh, your tenure had to be through the merit system, the federal government and sabbatical leave. No, they didn't have anything like that. And the federal government didn't either. So, uh, but technically you were supposed to be, go through the same uh, uh, panels for promotion as a professor. Mm -hmm. So it didn't mean a salary increase if you got advanced to associate professor or full professor, but you did have to go through the whole deal of uh, going through a review panel, et cetera. But so, you also had to do one of those for any advancement in the federal government, separate. Seems confusing. It's confusing. It's not confusing. It's it's too much paperwork and too much. <laughs> but that's a prob one of the reasons why I didn't want to get too much administration. But uh, the uh, but it was important for the units because the the concept of the cooperative unit program is, I think, is an excellent one because it it works. It means uh, the state and the federal government are working together with the university. So they could only be at land grant universities, state universities, and there had to be a um, memorandum of understanding that all of them signed. And that meant uh, the university provided an office, a secretary, and the salary for the secretary, and the operation of that office. And the federal government provided the salary for the unit leader and assistant unit leader. And, uh, but they didn't, uh, and then the Department of Fish and Game in this case, they provided a fixed amount of money per year, which was up around 25,000, I think. And that was used for stipends understood, I think it, I think it was specifically in the memorandum of understanding to, for support of graduate student training. So it could be stipends or some of their costs, but it was most of it went for stipend and we had to look for other money to cover costs. And, but we had some advantages because we were like a mini institute in the university and we had a uh, standard was 10% overhead if the money was coming from state or federal uh, agencies to support student projects. Whereas if it went through the business office for the Institute of Arctic Biology, which we were affiliated with, or the Department of Biology and Wildlife, they would, the university would take about 30, at that time, about 30% overhead. And now it's up around 50%. So, uh, that was a good deal. So we could we could go to Fish and Wildlife or Fish and Game, especially federal agencies, go to the Forest Service or the National Park Service or BLM and say, uh, you know, we have, a, you, you, you've indicated an interest in, in some area and we can, if you support a student uh, with a, a say a grant of 10 to 15,000 bucks at that time, uh, that would cover a lot. And they could frequently, they would provide logistics support too, like Fish and Game uh, would get more money through logistics support sometimes with uh, aircraft support. And it was good for the students because the students were then sometimes working with the federal apologists. Whereas if they had to hire somebody to do the study, it would have cost them mega bucks compared to having the student do the work. So it was good for the agencies to get these projects done, but it was particularly good for the students to get to work with agency people and frequently led to their getting jobs after they finished. Yeah, it was up. a 
a very, very successful program for the Department of Fish and Game, an excellent apprenticeship program. Yeah. Most of our, in, in the early days, most of all of our graduates went to Fish and Game and worked there. Well, uh, that was good because it was growing organization and growing responsibilities and funding of uh, federal aid and wildlife restoration were, in, was increasing. And so that was a good deal. And was it a good deal for you and your career to have worked there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I was happy uh, working there. And it was good in so many ways. I mean, I was there with other scientists and it kept me on my toes that way. And I, I'm a social person too. I mean, I liked being around. I loved working in Petersburg, but it was pretty isolated from contact with people that had similar interests. I mean, the Norwegian fishermen were nice people, but uh, you, if you they're not wildlife biologists, they're not wildlife biologists, <laughs> and they don't and they don't yeah. think the same as you do. I mean, you could have common con conversations, especially if you're both hunters. Yeah. But but uh, the it was socially uh, wasn't the greatest place. So I. I appreciate being with people where you can sit down and discuss and uh, argue with too in times. Mm -hmm. So you feel like you've made the right choice to have gone into wildlife management? Yeah, I've become more of a ecologist as I've matured. And, but yeah, basically that was my start and I still feel the, you know, trying to understand uh, natural systems and especially natural systems where we don't, that's one of the attraction in, of being Alaska rather than say uh, Missouri or other where it's good wildlife going, but a lot of it's related to land use. And uh, we don't have that much of that here in Alaska. There are problems. You know, there's problems, but there are different kind of problems that, like Kodiak Island with ranching cattle in the brown bear country, for example, and, and other problems with the bison in Delta, where <laughs> probably, you know, the amount of time that Fish and Game and Fish and Wildlife before has been on management of those bison compared to what they should spend on caribou or moose where it was huge and has been huge. And that's the same way with getting hung up on things like wolf management and bear management is that frequently the, those, those focus on trying to understand the basic relationship between the animals and their environment. And the wolves are part of it and the bears are part of it, but the vegetation is an important part of it. And that's what I feel what was the real loss in moving from territory with federal management was there was a, a big focus on habitat under federal management. It's understandable because they own all the land too. The, when statehood came, then it was attitude of the new Department of Fish and Game was their job was to uh, to, to learn more about animal population and numbers and because the state has to allocate harvests among potential users. And uh, most of the land was still in federal ownership. And so the state felt like federal government should take more of responsibility for habitat. Well, on federal lands, uh, they did on on, on, but not on BLM lands, you see. It was on mostly uh, park service and forest service lands. Uh, then, uh, but in, in the forest service is a poor example because the forest service, we were at odds when I was working for the federal government, Fish and Wildlife Service in Southeast Alaska because the forest service was re technically responsible for deer habitat and once they started logging, I mean, it was only wood that 
only fiber was the only thing they were interested in, and they were supposed to be a multiple resource agency. They didn't have, employ any in that, those early days. There were no Forest Service biologists. Yeah. They were all foresters. Yeah, and they just entered into the 50-year pulp and timber contracts. At the oh, yeah. Too, yeah, right. And the attitudes of the chief forester was, you know, so it was a sharp guy, but his whole attitude was, in the forest service in general, was get that old growth timber out and get the second growth into production. It's just wasting these resources to let them rot, these trees rot, old growth trees rot and on the land. And you say, well, what about habitat for wildlife? Oh, that's not important. This is a national forest. And we say, yeah, it's a national forest, and how is it you're not paying attention to wildlife? I mean, I remember we had a meeting with, uh, when I was a buddy here biologist with the federal government in Petersburg, and over problems with the lo first loggers were starting to log in southern Admiralty Island. And, they, you know, they were small-scale operators, but they were, it was mostly saw logs for wrangle and they had the whole families out there and and they would go to the head of these bays there were estuaries where uh, the uh, pink salmon were spawning actually in the intertidal areas and they they were using these to yard the logs and because the tide would go out could work with their equipment down there and and of course the bears came there and then the they weren't taking care of their garbage in the camp, and, and so they're having all these problems with the bears attracted to the camp where they, we got families with kids, and, and, and so he always says, well, I, maybe this is, uh, those bears shouldn't be there, and I said, well, why are they there? They'll be there because around your camp they're being attracted that because the not taking care of the garbage, and they said, well, we're trying to do a better job. But it, and then finally he got frustrated, and he said, let's face it, you know, this, the future of this is slogging. This is Admiral Town. The bear's got to go, he said. The bear's got to go. <laughs> yeah. and, and I said, well, look, wait a second. The bears have a place there. So you say the fish should go too or something? I didn't. We didn't yeah. carry it on. I said too much. Yeah, doesn't already... sound like a very good road to go down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the cooperative unit is still in existence or it has gone away? Is what? Is the cooperative unit still a functioning entity at UAS? Yeah, it's functioning. It, it's uh, at the moment... Oh, it, it was for a long time the fisheries was, uh, cop was, uh, the unit leader was a uh, fisheries guy, Tim Reynolds, and he retired eventually. And, and the next person was also a fisheries guy. They recruited from somebody who had been a unit leader in, back in West, uh, West Virginia, I think. And he was a pretty good guy, and he was here, and so that it's a little complicated because the fisheries people used to all be within, when we first merged, they were essentially all within the Department of Biology and Wildlife. But then later on with the marine science, some of them became professors in marine science, but the unit itself, remained affiliated with the Institute of Arctic Biology. And the wildlife people would be in, in the biology and wildlife department. And now it's back, Brad Griffith is now, he's a wildlifer and he's now the unit leader and so it's a wildlife person there, but they have fishery assistant unit leaders and they mostly are stayed within the biology and wildlife program, but they work closely with uh, and do some teaching courses in, in marine science and the School of Fisheries and 
oceanography or and something. And are they within the Institute of Arctic Biology? Or the unit is separate? Technic technically, yeah. Okay. Because all of, the, all, all of the faculty members in biology also have an appointment with the Institute of Arctic Biology, but that's technically the research component. And so research goes through the Institute of Arctic Biology and the wildlife unit and, and the cooperative unit, they, they do it through the uh, business office of the, of the IAB, okay. which we, in the early days, my, I had to have a secretary that kept the books as well as being the secretary. Okay. And so now it's handled through IAB, and there's some advantage to that. There were some disadvantages as well. Mm -hmm. well. I have just a few last questions, sort of sum summation questions um, about your overall career. And uh, you've talked about a lot of the highlights and the field work and how much you enjoyed that and working with other scientists. I'm wondering if you can talk about what may have been particularly difficult or challenging for you along the way through your career. Well, I think, especially when I first began, I mean, I, I hadn't any experience as, as a professor advising students, graduate students. And not in that, but at the beginning, I had students that were uh, there was uh, the biology program didn't have many faculty, so biology and wildlife, and so I was advising students that were doing projects on literally everything, and on marine mammals, on uh, um, waterfowl, and uh, and uh, recreation even. And sometimes I would be asked to by the School of Agriculture and Land Resource Management if I would be an advisor for one of their students because they didn't have any faculty that they felt were qualified, like a study of of cattle grazing on alpine habitat down in the in the Palmer area. Which was those kind of ch were challenges, but they were good for me because it forced me to broaden, and it and they were good in a way too because the the other members of this committee were like uh, people that were knowledgeable about agricultural areas and and domestic animals grazing, and so that was good. I, I feel good. Uh, one of the reasons I like the cooperative unit. Is that it forces you to uh, be broader, broader and to, to work with other units, and I think that's uh, has always been a problem. Especially state and federal has had greatest relationship, but the co-op unit we had students working on projects that were jointly funded by state and federal, and that was good, and that's good for the them to appreciate the advantages and there's some real advantages too with a, a cooperative agreement like that if you can get funding from more than one source then they can't they're less inclined to say oh we got a budget cut and for the second year we're not going to be able to come through well you made this agreement and and if there's two agencies funding it and they're only kicking in 10,000 bucks each as, whereas if it was one agency it was twenty thousand, yeah, that's pretty big, and so you cut it down to ten. Whereas when they each of them have this and they had agreed to it, then it works out well. And this usually, you sit down and the main thing is how can you, how can we keep get the student to finish the project and and do it satisfactorily from the student's standpoint, because it's always the student is a primary consideration that they get an adequate degree, 
and they're able to finish it in a reasonable way. And uh, so the cooperative nature of it is just terrific. And we used that in some cases where we were getting money from oil industry and they'd, they would challenge us to do a study in relationship to movement of caribou, for example, and, and they would come up with the funding, simulate a pipeline and spend big bucks on that. And they were funding the whole thing. And I, you know, when it came to sign an agreement, they said, we have to see the, we have to, you can't release any of this information until it goes approved by the oil industry. And I said, well, uh, I don't think we can do this then. And then I went to Fish and Wildlife and I said, can you kick in 10,000? And the oil industry was kicking 70,000 or something. And, and I said, because if you kick in, then the Freedom of Information Act requires that information to open. They did that and we went back to the oil industry and reluctantly, and they violated the, we, we did have a, an agreement that while you're collecting the data, that you wouldn't uh, release information on it right away. We wouldn't, and they wouldn't, but they violated it right away. <laughs> so in terms of your scientific research, is there a particular project that you've worked on that's your favorite or the, has been the most interesting and fulfilling for you? Well, I, probably, but I don't think that way. I mean, what I was thinking, uh, what I think is, uh, am I, what do I learn from this project and how does it fit into my picture of uh, ecology? And so what I realized I was becoming, where in Southeast Alaska, I was becoming uh, a deer habitat relationship expert and and I was fascinated on the planet animal interaction. And when I came to Fairbanks and so, as a unit leader, I got hooked on to working with caribou and musk oxen and moose. And, and I, uh, uh, then I, I was taking a broader interest and I began to think also about all the other aspects of herbivory, like how does moose and snowshoe hares relate in relationship to habitat and uh, you know, what are their impacts on the environment. And so it's sort of a broader ecological approach. And then as I was working in the Arctic and it, well, and some of the work in the Bering Sea Islands and, and St. Matthew fell in the same category. I was working in uh, where somewhat simpler ecosystem dynamics because there's fewer plant species that are important for the herbivores and there's not such a diversity of, of, of life. And so then I got hooked on Arctic and then the high Arctic and that's when I went to going to Greenland and Svalbard and, and, and Siberia and foreign exchanges. Those were the important, very important parts of my career development and becoming more interested in some of the work in Greenland I mean, where the ecosystems are very uh, small in terms of species diversity, but you can, it simplifies asking otherwise complex questions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, you have to focus in on so many things that you didn't think so much of like the, the long winter and the short growing season. What are the adaptations of the plants to exist up there where they're the ones that are key for the herbivores? Well, normally you think if the herbivores are focusing on one or two plants, they're gonna eat them, eat them up and they won't reproduce. So the plants have to have defenses and I get into secondary chemical defenses and tied in with some of the work that was being done here by students, our students, as well as faculty. And uh, so it broadened me. It's sort of like this nice thing I'm working on now with um, the geology at 
and of St. Matthew Island, how it relates to coastal erosion, which is very much tied to the uh, colonial nesting seabirds. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's what I was thinking. You're very broad in your approach to the research you do. And is that typical for somebody in your field or, or people? It's, it's not typical, but it is. There's others that have done the same thing, and uh, not perhaps as broad as I have been. And that's part of the fact that I've had this advantage of being here for a long time, but also working under the territory and then fish and wildlife and then the co-op unit, which, I mean, you can't, in the, in the university system where students are biting into projects and, and you have to help them get started. I mean, you have to become broader and broader in your thinking. And that's what I love. But you can't separate this from the fact that that I love being out in the field with the students or with anybody else. And, and part of that was just enjoying life, but enjoying life where, you know, when you stop and think about it, and you could rationalize that you were training the students, even though we were doing ski trips and things. <laughs> and we were both having a wonderful time in life, students, and and so was I. I mean, I was growing and and developing in my own way. Mm -hmm. But uh, with, and with Pat and Audrey, I mean, it was my, and my, my daughter and I, oldest daughter, I mean, we, we got, we just loved this, getting out in the field where we were out with nature and where you could see, read all this information about wildlife that we're all interested in. Yeah, it was great. I do remember one trip that we made with an airplane where uh, you needed to land on an icy lake and I agreed to land there and in the process we knocked the ski off the plane. I remember that. And, uh, <laughs> and you skied down the tree line cut a nice stubby forked spruce, brought it back up there, and we made a lever, levered the plane up, and I have to, happened to have four new axle bolts, and we put them on and went on our way. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we've had some adventures over the years. Right. Well, I was going to also ask that, Pat, you were a student of Dave's, is that correct? I, Fred Dean was actually my major professor, but Dave was on my committee, yeah. and I worked on grizzly bears north of Denali Park, yeah. and that was in the early and mid-1970s. But since then, Dave and I have maintained a fairly close relationship and cooperated on caribou projects and whatnot. Because yeah, you went on to work for Fish and Game. I went on to work for Fish and Game. I went on to work for Fish and Game in 1977. I worked for Fish and Game for 28 years as a caribou biologist. Mm -hmm. So Dave is very humble and doesn't necessarily talk about his contributions and accomplishments. As a fellow caribou biologist, can you comment on what his contributions to the field have been? Yeah, Dave's contributions have been tremendous to not only caribou biology, but biology of northern ungulates in general. And, you know, as he mentioned, uh, his variety of graduate students from all over the world working on such a variety of mountain species like goats and sheep and muskox and moose and caribou provided a tremendous melting pot that we all uh, really appreciated. Uh, all of the graduate students that we interacted with, you know, I worked on caribou, but I very much enjoyed talking and uh, working with Dave's students on moose and sheep and all of the other species. So uh, Dave's leadership at the Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit created this focal point for biologists from both the Fish and Wildlife Service and BLM and the Department of Fish and Game to gather occasionally at the university uh, for various graduate student seminars, thesis defenses, you know, all of those kinds of things, and then uh, social functions after those kinds of things, uh, and then field trips as well. So when you put that all together, 
Dave's contribution to wildlife management in Alaska is really hard to overestimate. I think it's one of the most phenomenal contributions of any single person to the field of wildlife management that I can think of in, you know, in the history of the profession. So it's really a, a phenomenal thing. Okay. The, the one point though that Pat mentioned, which is an important point, and it's, it's, a, it's it was important in my career, and that is the international connections. And that, you know, I, I, that uh, six months in, in uh, Denmark, the first time uh, was doing a study for Rodeo. It was sort of like a sabbatical leave, but I had to go with the family and uh, we had, I had to save up vacation time and I had to find a rental for a house and 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 then I did the same thing for a full year and we had the Fulbright grant to cover travel expenses but I had to work out a deal. In both cases I worked out a deal where the research was done in collaboration with the Danes in Denmark and then the uh, uh, Norwegians at the University of Oslo, where I gave some lectures, et cetera, but I was involved in research there. And then this stimulated more, uh, more connections and, and with all the Scandinavian countries and Finland and then official exchanges uh, with Russia and with the Soviet Union under the uh, Nixon Brezhnev detente mm -hmm. agreement on science exchanges. This was Arctic work, making connections with people, and the Scandinavian ones, and and then uh, some of my grad students were from Canada, and uh, so it was this circum Arctic uh, uh, experiences of me and then Bre and that was si simulated and those kinds of connections led to graduate students yeah. who came to Alaska and, and, and we had and, uh, official exchanges yeah, right. with the uh, University of Copenhagen as well as uh, the Agricultural University in in uh, Norway and this thing just continued to grow and uh, in a very positive way for me and I've and had postdocs over from those that worked with fish and game and and did uh, studies and it was to me it would uh, things couldn't have gone better in terms of what I had aspired for but also I gained so much more that I wasn't aware how important these international connections were as well as uh, connections in North America. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I did, are we still on? Mm -hmm. One of the things I did when, as a co-op unit leader in the early days is I th tried to convince our supervisor in Washington DC that we ought to have exchanges between the units, you know, the unit leaders and assistant leaders should, uh, we should have an ex exchanges and and uh, the, the guy who was heading us up then, Reed Goforth, was, uh, yeah, he thought that's a good idea, but I don't see how we can do that with a budget. And I said, well, if we did these exchanges, so we'd keep it down to a minimum and it'd be a two week exchange. So you wouldn't have to fill somebody in. And, and so, uh, and we'd live in the unit leader's home, <laughs> vice versa, when they came and to her visit and we'd involve them in activities. And so I worked out the first exchange for the unit program was with Ohio Cooperative Unit and Alaska and uh, uh, the unit leader there was a terrific guy and, and people and other units said, how come you would go to exchange with Ohio? There's not much there from Alaska. Alaska, maybe, but not. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, that was a terrific trip because we. There's no mountains in Ohio. <laughs> but the sad, wonderful waterfall marshes and, and it took 
you know, he took me around, and then I took him up in the north, and we did a ski trip, and managed to, he managed to freeze a toe <laughs> in a snow cave up in Attigan Canyon. And I did the same with uh, the Arizona assistant unit leader, uh, who was a ardent photographer, and I included him on the field trip down to southeast Alaska. And oh man, it was so great to have someone like that along with the students. I mean, not just me, and I did this and other one when we had a, so, uh, oh, uh, what's his name that was from Montana? He did a sabbatical here. Um, another name that doesn't pop into my mind. Mm. But it, to have these people coming to, and get involved in unit programs that, and to me it was, I was creating a, a, ver a learning environment that was so good for the students as well as for me and for the person who was visiting. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, that thing never went beyond three exchanges that I was involved with. Yeah. I Virginia. think that's a key statement right there, creating a really good learning environment over the years. I think that's probably, you hit the nail on, on the head yeah. there, Dave. That's probably yeah. the, yeah. Well, some of the things <laughs> we did, which was sort of a unit, but <laughs> was that uh, uh, Schist Creek uh, cabin, right. yeah. a tent camp. And I got a, had to go and get a permit, you know, to do this. And But it was, a, I couldn't have done it by myself. Yeah, we had a whole train of people on skis hauling sleds. And, 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 and we ha hauled in this the, stuff, which yeah. was a... And it on was the way, you get to see ptarmigan and caribou. And it was an expedition, and, you know, so. but it was it was a team effort, and <laughs> it was so much terrific people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it definitely seems like Dave, you get great pleasure in your students and training up and coming new young biologists and wildlife. Oh, managers. definitely, definitely, yeah. Pat, do you have any other questions or things you want to say? Okay. Shall we call it an evening on that happy note? Fine with me. Okay. Yep.